Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation in private equity, where we look at things like how academic models measure private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinard. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run a website called Exilia Mathematica, and I wrote a book titled Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. VC103 is the third video in the series, and it's the one where we make our first real leverage measurement to quantify how debt can amplify equity gains and losses. Now, to the best of my knowledge, this November 2009 presentation titled Value Creation and Private Equity was the first attempt to measure leverage in a systematic and fairly rigorous way. It was a collaboration between Capital Dynamics and the Center for Entrepreneurial and Financial Studies at the Technical University of Munich. A few months later, the CEFS authors published a follow-up in the Journal of Private Equity. This was titled Value Creation Drivers and Private Equity Buyouts, Colon, Empirical Evidence from Europe. You can find citations and links for these on my website and in the description below. The Munich team published another paper in 2015 titled International Evidence on Value Creation in Private Equity Transactions. This was featured in the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance. And again, you can find citations and links below. Now, this last paper is singular in its level of detail. It provides an illustrative example and lays out all the math in such a way that leaves no ambiguity about how the analysis was performed. In this episode and on my site, I describe the approach outlined in these papers as the Tactical University of Munich Model of Value Creation, or simply the Munich Model. However, I take some liberties in the way that I rearrange the formulas to put them in a form that's more consistent with the models in my book. It's basically mathematically equivalent, but with two exceptions. First, the paper uses a different set of units to measure value creation. This doesn't impact the results or interpretations. We're basically talking about kilometers versus miles. In these videos, I usually start by measuring value creation in terms of dollars, absolute value creation for which I use the letter V. The paper uses times money units, which simply divides every item on this chart by invested capital. So in times money terms, invested capital is always 1.0x and everything else scales to that number. The authors also tend to cut off the bottom half of the chart, so you're only looking at value creation that occurs over and above invested capital. In this view, times money value creation is always equal to the gross multiple of invested capital minus one, and the value drivers always add up to this number. Now, the second difference is more than just units. It's a methodological difference that has a slight influence on the results interpretations. I always use holding period averages in my models. So EBITDA growth is proportional to EBITDA change times the average valuation multiple, and multiple expansion is proportional to the valuation change times the average EBITDA. Instead, the Munich model uses the entry values for both the multiple and the EBITDA, and then to make sure everything adds up to the right number, they create a third value driver called a combo factor, and this is equal to the product of delta E and delta M. Now, the last video made a pretty strong case that holding period averages are superior. They make more intuitive sense, reduce volatility, and they provide better mathematical fits to real-world EBITDA and valuation movements. The combo factors add very little in the way of meaningful insight, but they do add many extra terms to the equations and to the charts. For example, in the first video, we showed a value bridge where there are 20 different value drivers. An approach with combo factors would introduce about a dozen new value creation components that really clutter up the charts and spreadsheets with very little benefit. So as we go through the next section, we'll just pretend that all the models use holding period averages. That will allow us to focus on and compare the ways that the different models measure leverage, and that's what we're really trying to achieve and understand in this video. We know the value creation is a change in equity value. The Munich model proposes the existence of a number called lambda, so that when you multiply delta tech V by lambda, you get the unlevered return, or what the return would have been if a deal was 100% equity funded. What is left would be the leverage effect, or value creation times 1 minus lambda. The math over here shows that these two terms do in fact add up to the right delta tech V. Now, the conventional model that we discussed in the last video, VC102, breaks value creation into EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, and cash flow generation. We can substitute those formulas into the first delta tech V term here. When you do that and follow through with all the math, you get four value drivers, all of which include this lambda term. They are effectively unlevering the conventional model value drivers. Here's what they look like in the Munich model. The change in EBITDA term is the EBITDA effect. The change in multiple term is the multiple effect. The change in the net debt term is the free cash flow effect. And all the stuff that's left over is the leverage effect. Okay, so it looks like we're making progress. We just need to figure out what this lambda term is. 
In the Munich model, lambda is approximated as the unlevered IRR divided by the total equity IRR. The denominator here is the equity return that includes the influence of leverage or growth equity, and it's the number that you'll find in the fund's quarterly report. You can also measure lambda in the times money domain using this formula here. Okay, so we appear to be making some progress. What's the unlevered IRR or the unlevered times money? One way to do this would be to look at the deal's return as if it was 100% equity funded. So you replace the debt funding with equity funding, you add back the interest payments, you deduct the debt tax shield, you distribute excess cash flows to shareholders, and then you measure the resulting IRR. Nobody does this, however, because it would take a lot of work for every company, and most analysts don't have access to all the necessary data anyway. So the Munich model proposes an alternative. This is the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC formula, which should be pretty familiar to most of you. It's used to value privately held companies and evaluate project financing decisions. The first parenthetical is equity over equity plus debt. This is the equity ratio or percent equity in the company's capital structure. This is multiplied by the cost of equity. The second parenthetical, debt over equity plus debt, is the debt ratio, and this is multiplied by one minus the corporate tax rate and the cost of debt. In the Munich model framework, the unlevered IRR replaces the WAC, and the equity IRR replaces the cost of equity. After that, you do a little bit of math to transform the equity ratio and the debt ratios into terms that contain debt to equity ratios. And at last, we had the Munich model equation for unlevered IRR. Now, I think it's important to stress something here. These papers that we mentioned earlier, they did not exist to create a perfect little chart for a single company or a case study for a private equity fundraising deck. They were working with data sets that included thousands of companies, and from them, they were trying to deduce broader industry dynamics or trends. For many of the companies in their sample, they didn't have all the necessary data to do a perfect calculation, so they used various estimates and approximations in their formulas and then used statistical techniques to validate that their results were meaningful. So in practice, the researchers excluded the corporate tax term, they estimate the average debt to equity ratio, and they use LIBOR plus 300 basis points for the cost of debt since actual weighted average interest rates are rarely available for private equity deals. So with these simplifications, we calculate lambda, which has the following formulas in the IRR domain and in the times money domain. In the IRR domain, the lowercase r sub d term is the annual interest rate that we mentioned earlier. And in the times money domain, the capital R sub B term is the annual rate compounded over the holding period. Okay, let's see how this lambda term would work in practice. Consider a company with zero net debt. This would make the debt to equity ratio in the formula go to zero and lambda go to one or 100%. When this happens, there is no leverage effect and the unlevered return becomes identical to the total equity return. This is exactly what we'd expect to happen for an unlevered deal. Now, if there is debt, lambda can either be greater than one or less than one. Consider a deal with a positive equity return and therefore a positive IRR. In this case, lambda would be less than one whenever a company's equity IRR outperforms its cost of debt. When this happens, we have a positive leverage effect and an unlevered return that is smaller than the total equity return. This is exactly what we would expect from our intuition. And you can play with the numbers to see that it also makes sense for other scenarios like deals with growth equity or deals with negative returns. So these are the final Munich model formulas for the EBITDA effect, multiple effect, free cash flow effect, and leverage effect. They are more complicated than the equations that we will discuss in the next video, but they're not too difficult to work with. In practice, you will usually calculate Lambda off to the side of your Excel spreadsheet and then use it as a factor to scale the other value drivers. So that's the Munich model. It works pretty well, but it does have its shortcomings. First of all, the leverage effect is basically a plug. We calculate what we think the correct unlevered return should be, and then just assume that everything else is the leverage effect. We mentioned in the last video, we don't like plugs because if there's an error in one of the value drivers, it always flows into the plug, and that makes it difficult to know when errors occur and fix them. And that's a problem here because the unlevered IRR formula tends to fail under the stress of either high debt or large changes in debt. To see this, consider a company that grows its enterprise valuation from 100 to 180 over four years. So that's about a 15.8% kegger in the enterprise valuation. To stress the unlevered IRR formula a bit, we will hold the enterprise valuations constant and let net debt at entry be either 0, 25, 50, or 75, and then let net debt at exit range from 0 to 150, again in increments of 25. This creates 28 different return scenarios.
In this table, you see the gross MOAC ranges from 0.3x to 7.2x, and the total equity IRR ranges from minus 26% to about 64%. Now this gives us everything we need to calculate the Munich model's unlevered IRR. We can get average debt to equity ratio using the numbers in the upper left, pull the IRR from the total equity return table, and we can estimate the interest rate and the corporate tax rate with values like these here. But before we calculate, let's think about the kind of answer that we should expect. We know that the company's enterprise valuation grew at a rate of 15.8%. And if you look at the equity returns table, you see the scenario with zero net debt at both entry and exit has an equity IRR of 15.8%. This is a pretty good guess of our unlevered IRR because this is the 100% equity funded scenario. So the unlevered IRR for all 28 scenarios should be around this 16% number. However, when you run the numbers through the Munich model, you find that many of them stray from that 16% target. In fact, several of them are negative, and this doesn't make sense. Enterprise valuation grew, and anything that grows should have a positive IRR. For comparison, consider the unlevered IRRs determined by the derivative model of value creation that we will start to discuss in the next video. They're all much closer to our 16% target, and the math behind them is far simpler than the Munich model equations we showed earlier. This is of course important because in the Munich model, any errors in the unlevered IRR lead to errors in Lambda. And this leads to errors in the unlevered return and the leverage effect. And this leads to errors in all of the other downstream value creation components. This is a significant shortcoming of the Munich model, and it's a shortcoming that's not present in the next two value creation models that we'll discuss, namely the derivative model of value creation and the logarithmic model of value creation. There's just one more point worth mentioning in this video. In this version of the Munich model, two of the four value drivers have very obvious interpretations. Lambda unlevers EBITDA growth, which is driven by EBITDA change. Likewise, Lambda unlevers multiple expansion, which is driven by valuation change. However, the free cash flow effect term, what does it mean to unlever the net debt change? This doesn't tell us what the cash flow would have been if the company didn't have debt. Even though Lambda has the interest rate and the tax rate components in its formula, mechanically, that's not what's happening with the equation. And then the leverage effect term doesn't really have intuitive mechanics either. One way to think about leverage is to ask, for a given change in enterprise value, how much more equity did I generate because I had debt on the balance sheet? This doesn't seem to tell us that. Well, an interesting thing happens if you replace the leverage effects delta tech V term with the change in enterprise valuation minus the change in net debt. When you multiply it all out, four terms emerge. The two delta ND dot lambda terms cancel and the free cash flow effect and the leverage effect simplify to minus the change in net debt plus the change in enterprise valuation times one minus lambda. The first term is exactly the same as the cash flow generation term that we find in the conventional model of value creation. And the second term is a very good approximation of gearing, the amount of additional equity gained or lost because there was either debt or excess cash on the company's balance sheet. I call this the modified Munich model of value creation and we'll see it again because it looks very similar to the value creation model that we will start to discuss in the next section. And this is kind of remarkable because the derivative model of value creation has a completely different starting point that makes no reference to either Lambda or the unlevered IRR. Whenever you try to model the real world with math, it's very comforting when you get the similar answers after coming to the problem from different directions. We'll start to see that play out in the next episode. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website, Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.